month, we, we, are, uh, we are vision casting for the year 2024, and our vision for next year is more in 2024. And so many times we have done vision at the first part of a year, uh, you know, between January, February, sometimes up into March, we will cast vision for uh, that year. We felt like the best way to hit 2024 was on January 1st, we knew exactly what we were going to be doing. So we, we decided to uh, push vision back into the month of October. And <clears throat> as I begin... <clears throat> As I began talking about vision, we actually started towards the end of September talking about this. Um, vision casting usually involves defining what we're going to accomplish as a church next year. Um, I believe that the activities of a church come easy when identity is certain. And for the past three years, we've had some twists and turns. We've had some challenges, and we've had some changes. We've had some adjustments. Uh, in fact, while Charlie Barnes was here, we were out driving one day and uh, just kind of reviewing some of the things that happened and, uh, and some of the things that he said. Uh, when, uh, when Julie and I became pastors of the church, uh, he said, you know, I, I, uh, the word from the Lord that I gave y'all was that you would, you would truly be in the wilderness like worshiping uh, in the tabernacle, not realizing you guys were actually going to be in a tent. <laughs> and uh, he said, and, you know, just looking back, you guys have, have, have kind of, you, you've dealt with a lot of things. A lot of churches have throughout the past couple of years since COVID. Um, I don't think we have to define what we are doing as much as we need to determine who we are as a church. And that's why I've taken these, these few weeks to unfold what vision looks like, uh, largely talking about who you are and what the church really is, uh, because I believe that's just as important, if not more important, than uh, developing a plan for next year. Now, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, I believe in strategy. I believe in a church strategy. We have to have a strategy as we lead and as we go throughout the next year, there is a strategy to doing some of the things that we want to do. But before we get into strategy, um, I want to lay some of the groundwork that we've been talking about and create a basis for determining who we are as a church because one thing that that generates is unity. And we can't do anything as a church unless we are a unified body. Amen. So we've been, I've been praying that the Lord bring unity in our church, uh, praying that the Lord would, would allow me uh, the ability to talk about the importance of unity in, in the pulpit and what that means, because we can accomplish anything that we want to if we are unified as one. And I said this last week, there were 120 people in one room in Acts chapter 2. And because they were in unity, they received the Holy Spirit as Christ promised. And they went from 120 to 3,120 in a matter of hours. Amen? So that's what happens when unity it, it gathers and grows in a church. Now, I said this. It's important that we determine who we are. And I use the word determine. As a church, we know who we are. We know what the vision of the church is. We know the things that we want to accomplish. But it's up to us to determine what we are going to be in Christ. Because your destiny in Christ is your choice. You can choose to follow it out or you can choose to do, the way, do it the way you want to do it. And if you do it the way you want to do it, you're not going to fulfill your destiny in Christ. You're not going to live that out because you're fulfilling your own destiny that you've made. And it's not what God has designed. And it's a shame, and I'm sure you've heard me, heard me say this before. <clears throat> Most people don't ever live out their destiny in Christ because they won't go all in. There are many people, many believers who call themselves Christians that don't, live out their destiny in Christ because they get to a certain point and they plateau. And they say, well, I've given the Lord so much, but I'm not willing to give him everything. Or these are the things I like to keep in control. Or I'm not going to submit this 
this issue to him. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to carry this baggage. I'm going to do this thing the way I want to. Uh, I'm going to follow my own dream and my own desire. And so many people live that path rather than determining I'm going to go all in and I'm just going to see what the Lord's going to do. <laughs> I love the sermon that Pastor Tommy Barnett preached back in March of this year. Uh, how many of you remember that? Surprise me. <laughs> Instead of the Lord saying, you can have anything you want, and then we turn around and say, I just want what you want for me, Lord. Just surprise me. Just surprise me. You may be only one decision away from experiencing your destiny in Christ. One decision. <clears throat> Do you know that one decision can change the course of history? One person making one decision can change the course of history. Everybody <clears throat> in this room are potential world changers. Think of it that way. <clears throat> There was a man uh, that lived in the 19th century named Joshua Chamberlain. He was a college professor in the great state of Maine. And as the Civil War had unfolded in the mid-1800s, he felt led to, uh, to volunteer to fight in the Union Army. He had no military background. He had no experience in battle. He wasn't a fighter. He was a college professor. But he felt like he needed to uh, defend the Union. So he joined the ranks of the Union Army, and he became lieutenant colonel of the 20th Maine Regiment. It was a volunteer regiment. He was placed at the Battle of Gettysburg and was uh, over the regiment that was tasked to hold ground on some higher elevated space on the battlefield called Little Round Top. And <clears throat> Little Round Top was, um, they were losing ground. The Union Army was losing ground. And the Confederate soldiers had advanced to the point where um, the Union Army had dwindled their supplies, they had dwindled their ammunition, they were, they were losing soldiers. And Josh Chamberlain would make one decision that literally changed the course of history. He was down to 386 Union soldiers trying to hold Little Round Top, and the Confederate Army was advancing with thousands of soldiers. They had just ran out of ammo, and he had to make a decision of what to do. Should they surrender, or should they fight? He made a single command, and he, his command was this, bayonets. That means you put knives on the end of your rifle and you fight hand to hand. When he made that command and they charged at, at the Confederate Army, thousands of Confederate soldiers against 386 Union soldiers, uh, they began to prevail in the fight. And those 300 plus soldiers captured over 3,000 <laughs> Confederate soldiers. If you study the Civil War, you will see, and you can even just Google this, the turning point of the Civil War was Gettysburg. The Confederate Army was advancing to the point where if they would have won Gettysburg, they could have won the war. But one decision to go all in by one person changed the course of history. What seemed like was going to be a suicide mission ended up being the decisive point 
of the whole war. Historians believe that if uh, the Battle of Gettysburg would have been lost and the rebels have won the battle, that the Confederates would have won the war and history would be forever different. One man's courage saved the day, saved the war, saved the Union. And it reminds me of this old proverb that says, for want of a nail. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Wow. Chamberlain was quoted as saying this, I had deep within me the inability to do nothing. <laughs> that you, amen. We would call that down here, he had a good case of that can't help it. Amen. <laughs> There, there was no option other than to go all in. My vision for the river is that we all in unity develop the inability to do nothing. The mission statement of the river has been this, to go and do, not staying contained, but reaching beyond these walls to invade the darkness with the love of Christ. We cannot just sit still. We can't just wait for something to happen. We can't surrender. We have to continue to move forward, even if it looks like, Lord, there's no way that this is going to unfold. <laughs> Do you not know who your life partner is? <laughs> Amen? Because here's the thing that I know about the river. It's not a church of complacency. We are a church of movement. The river is not a dead church. It's a church that is alive. The river is not a social club. We are a kingdom-minded, purpose-driven church. Amen? The river is not a religious place. We are a fellowship that exists within God's kingdom. And it's going to become more and more difficult to just attend the river. You, you that, that think, well, I just go there on Sunday and that's all I do, it's going to get hard for you to just do that. Because here's the thing, all in is infectious. <laughs> Amen. You will not be able to just attend. Because here's the thing, radical is our normal. Amen. Jesus freak is appropriate for me. Amen. Amen. What makes us think that we can ask for more in 2024? Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a bold statement. Why would we have the audacity to say, I want more in 2024? There was a prophet in the Old Testament that did that. He asked for more. I want to read this story to you. <clears throat> in 1 Kings 19, verse 16, this is God talking to Elijah about what needs to happen from this point forward. He's giving him his instructions, and this is what he says. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Elisha was given an opportunity to walk with Elijah and be his servant. And he began to learn from the prophet of God. He began to understand how a prophet is to respond, how a prophet is to listen, how a prophet is to study, how a prophet uh, is to function in the role of being a prophet. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, we see where God is about to take Elijah to heaven, and everybody knows it, and Elisha had gotten so close to him. And Elisha would not leave his side. Elijah would say, well, I need to go over here and I need to do this. And Elisha said, well, I'm going with you. And then Elijah would say, well, I need to go over here and do this. He said, I'm not leaving your side. I'm going with you. And the other prophets would say, uh, Elisha, you, you realize uh, that your, your master, Elijah, he's about to leave. He's about to go to heaven. And he'd go, I know, shut up. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> He was, he was glued to Elijah because he said, he said, I want to go wherever you go. And in verse 9 of 2 Kings chapter 2, it says, And so it was when they had crossed over, they were traveling together, and Elijah said this to Elisha, 
ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said this, <laughs> please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. <laughs> Elisha said, he basically said this, I want more. Everything that has happened to you as God's prophet, everything that you've accomplished, the anointing you carry, everything about you, Elijah, I want twice as much. <laughs> I want more. How could Elisha have the audacity to ask for more? That's a lot to say to the prophet that slayed uh, 800 prophets of Baal called fire down from heaven, uh, called for a drought, and then called for it to rain. And then Elisha is saying, I want twice of what you got. What makes him think that he was in a position to ask for more? Ask for a double portion. We have to back up to 1 Kings in, in verse 19. When Elijah had received his instruction to anoint Elisha, this is what happened. It said, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him, threw his mantle on him, and he left his oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother and, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him. Pay attention to this. He took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Elisha could ask for more because he had gone all in. The place where Elisha was from, and we read it in the earlier scripture, it was called Abel Mahola. Translated from Hebrew, this is what it means. Meadow of dancing. Abel Mahola was, was uh, it was very lush. It had very rich soil. It was in the bread basket of the Jordan River Valley. So having land here would have come at a premium. And the scriptures say that Elisha had 12 yoke of oxen, and he was at the 12th. So you have to think about what the culture was at this point in time. If you had a family-ran farm, at this point in time, it was a very small enterprise. Most families, if they had a yoke of oxen, they had one yoke of oxen. Elisha had 12 yoke of oxen. Elisha was son of Shaphat, and they had land in what was considered a very premium area to have land in. Elisha was the heir apparent of a wealthy business and valuable assets. But what did he do? He took the oxen that he had the yoke of, and he killed the oxen, and he used the yoke to start a fire. He basically said, hey, I'm following the Lord, and we're going to throw a barbecue. <laughs> Amen. I like the way he thinks. And <laughs> here's what he did. He disinherited himself from anything that could, he could possibly receive as an earthly inheritance. You know, if, if you are to uh, receive uh, your father's inheritance, the one thing you probably shouldn't do is kill it and burn it. <laughs> that kind of gives, uh, uh, that, that's kind of a signal that, hey, I don't want to be a part of this. He had eliminated his, every option he had to receive his inheritance to the point where he said, I'm not going back. I am eliminating everything. I am, I am, we're going to kill the oxen. We're going to eat it. We're going to, I'm going to burn the plow. This, this is over with for me. I'm going to follow God. Elisha went all in. When you don't hold back, when you give him everything, you can ask for anything and know it's going to happen. 
Why? Because you've gone all in. The meadow of dancing or dancing meadow was a safe place for Elisha. It was the safe bet. It was the smart investment. How many of you have ever watched and tried to figure out what is the smartest way for me to do this? What is the best way to do What's the most, the, 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 the most solid ground that I can stand on? That's what the meadow of dancing was for Elisha. There was no risk there. It was the safe bet. It didn't require any faith to stay there. But it was a huge step of faith to put everything on God and to go all in. And that's what Elisha did. <laughs> there was another man in the Old Testament that lived out all in. And God gave him an opportunity to prove it, and he did. God told Abraham to take his son Isaac. He said, take him to the mountains of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham, Abraham had to do this. He had to decide, am I going to go all in? You know, you read through the story of Abraham. At one point in time, he was Abram. And you see time after time that he followed the Lord in spite of the things that were happening around him. So I look at Abraham as, you know, in his life, he was all in. But for whatever reason, God felt the need to give him an opportunity to prove that once again. God tested his faithfulness. And here's the thing. God never intended that Isaac was to be killed. Abraham just had to prove that he was all in. That's what this was all about. Abraham had to show, yes, Lord, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you will ask me to do in spite of what I would rather do. How many times when we got to that place, we just did what we wanted to do? You know, we can take something that God gave us and over time it can become more important than our faithfulness and our commitment to Him, than our relationship with Him. If you read the Old Testament, you know the story of Isaac. He was a miraculous gift from God. He was a promise fulfilled. You're looking at Two parents, one 100 years old, one 90 years old. And God said, you're going to have a child. <laughs> and the 90-year-old laughed. <laughs> God changed their names, changed their identity, but they had to realize who they were. They had to say, okay, I'm not Abram anymore. I'm Abraham. That's who I am. I'm not Sarah. I'm not quarrelsome. I'm Sarah now. <laughs> When they began to understand what their identity was and who God had called them to be, then God blessed them. But we have to be careful that in following that out, that we don't take the thing that God has blessed us with and place it higher than him. And Abraham showed that he was all in when he was willing to sacrifice his son when God said, this is what you need to do. All in means that we have to determine what our Isaac is in our life. We have to put it in perspective. Isaac could be something that we were blessed with. Isaac, the Isaac in our lives could be anything that God has given us. It could be a relationship. It could be a job. It could be a career. It could be a, a boat. <laughs> it could be a a family business. could be a piece of jewelry. It could be a dream that God has given you. But in some point in time, you have pursued the dream more than you have pursued the relationship with God. And it doesn't necessarily mean God wants to take it away from you, but you have to change your perspective and say, this is not my identity. 
I have let this turn into something else. My identity is I am who I am that God has made me to be. And I'm not going to pursue anything else any greater than, than the relationship with him. And sometimes we have to show God that what he gave us isn't as important as he is. It doesn't mean we're going to lose it. Amen. It doesn't mean we're, it, it doesn't mean we're going to lose. Sometimes God may take it and break it down and build it back up. But Abraham was willing to take that thing that God blessed him with and put it on the altar and say, Lord, you gave it to me. This is yours. And then whatever you're going to do with it from here, I'm okay with it. That's going all in. 